it's uh, it's great to be here with uh, with all of you, and uh, we'll try to you know I, I got a lot of questions from all of you, which is wonderful. Uh, we'll try to see how many we can get through today. So uh, maybe the first question, and if you could just raise your hand, wait for the mic, and then uh, tell us your name, where you're from, and then your question. That'll be great. Morning, sir. I am Avilash Raut from JNB Jharsuda, Odisha. Sir, it is a known fact that running NGO means you do not have to pay tax to the government. So the question is, is running Dakshana a business strategy or you really want to help students from poor sections? Okay, well, that's a great question. Please have a seat. Um, so, uh, let's say, uh, I'll, I'll give you these numbers in dollars, you know, just so that you have but you can convert it to rupees. But let's say I make $1 million, okay? And in the, in the US, where I live in California, the tax rate is about 50%. So if there's no Dakshana, I'll make 1 million and after tax, I'll have 500,000. And government will get 500,000. Okay? Now, let's say I give 50% to Dakshana. So, what will happen is that uh, my income. It will, it will do, what will happen is there'll be one million and I get a tax reduction, so minus 500,000. So my income will be 500,000. So then I'll pay 50% tax on this 500,000. So I will get 250,000. Government will get 250,000. And Dakshana, in the first case, gets zero. In the second case, gets 500,000. Does that make sense? Everyone understand the math? Yes. So the bottom line is that if I look at my situation over here, So, um, so basically, if you look at my situation, uh, if there's no NGO, there's no Dakshana, I get to keep $500,000, five lakhs. And if there is Dakshana, and I give away five lakhs, or five, 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 $500,000, I get to keep half that amount. So if I look at it purely from my family's perspective, and that is the primary driver, this is better. It's better not to have Dakshana. I'll have more money, right? Um, but if I look at it from, um, so the, the, reason, the reason Dakshana was created was not to, was not to get some benefit from the government because any benefit you get from the government is less than the amount that you would, have, you would have had without that benefit, right? So there's no way I can increase this number. No matter what I do, this number will go down, right? If I, if I, if I have uh, 10 lakhs in income and I give away 1 lakh, then I'll get, I'll get taxed on 900,000, so I'll have 450,000. So again, it'll go down. So no matter what I do, the number goes down. So the driver to create Dakshana was not to uh, get some business benefit, because there is no business benefit. Uh, and once, once the money goes over here, it cannot be used uh, for personal gain. You know, so there are a lot of rules in how, uh, which is why the government allows that, 
So actually in this situation what happens is, uh, if I look at this situation, so my income went down, government income went down, but something interesting happened. So what happened is government was getting 5 lakhs, now it's getting 2.5 lakhs. But the 2.5 lakhs that did not go to the government actually gets utilized better than if that money had gone to the government. Because uh, we are a lot better at using the money than the government is. So actually, even though this goes from five to two and a half, um, so what happens in Dakshina is that if I split this money into two parts, government lost 250, and Monish lost 250, right? That's what happened here. So government lost 250. This, five, this 500,000 here has tremendous benefit to society. Way more than if it, the 250 was 500, and actually even more than if this was over here. So with this scenario here, we actually have a very good outcome for everyone except for me. If I look at it just for me, it's, the outcome is not that great. But it is a very good outcome for society. Uh, because basically, the government money got utilized better. And on top of that, there was more money than even what the government lost. So it worked out pretty well. So then the, the question comes up is, why, why should anyone set up an NGO, right? If you're not going to get a benefit out of it, then uh, why, uh, why go through a trouble of setting up an NGO? And the answer to that question is, uh, the reason Dakshina was set up is because I had no choice. So, and the reason I have no choice is that uh, we need a certain amount of money to live, right? So let's say, let's say some number X is what I need to have a comfortable life. Now, if I increase spending from X to 3X, bigger house, better car, all kinds of things, when I go from x to 3x, will the happiness triple? Will it double? What about 1.1? 1.1 may happen, right? 10% may happen. But the thing is, you don't get a 3x thing. And if you take the 3x to 10x, then happiness increasing or uh, you know, any, any benefits coming, they keep going down. You know, so after a certain point, I mean, if someone is uh, homeless and doesn't have enough to eat, whatever, if you give them some money, a huge improvement in their life. Once they have the basics, then you keep adding more, you're not going to have much more improvement. So, so basically, the, the point is that um, if the system is giving you more money than you need, after you have optimized happiness, then after that, if you decide, OK, there's no point spending any more than this, that money is going to build up, right? And in the end, one of the best things about life is death. So the world would look very different if humans lived for 1,000 years. So. If I was going to live for a thousand years, I would probably not set up Dakshina. Not till at least I was 800 years old or 700 years old. You know what I'm saying? I would push it out, possibly. I don't know. I haven't thought about it very well. But, uh, but the thing is that we have finite lifetimes, right? And so if there is a certain amount of money, I mean, let's say there's uh, 100 crores. 
that a person has saved through their life, right? They lived a good life, they were pretty happy, and now this extra 100 crores is there. So there are only two things you can do with 100 crores because you're going to die. So you can either give it to your family or you can give it to society. There's no other choice. Those are the only two options. Um, now, if you give it to your family, uh, it actually has a negative impact. So, uh, so in general, uh, one of the reasons why I think my, my life so far has gone pretty well is because actually in my case, my father went bankrupt when I was in college. Best thing that happened to me. Because when I was finishing college, there was nothing for me to look at, okay, there's some business or something I can go for. There was nothing available. So I had to kind of chart my own path, right? And that was an advantage. Um, so large inheritances given to your children or grandchildren are basically going to uh, kind of make life less interesting for them. Because you, know, you may not have a need to work, uh, then what are you going to do with all your time? And are you going to be happy? A lot of issues come up. So in general, um, you know, I, I'm a, uh, one of my gurus is a guy named Warren Buffett. How many of you have heard of Warren Buffett? So, few of you. So Warren Buffett is an investor. He's done really well. He used to be the wealthiest person in the world. I think now he's like third or fourth wealthiest. So Warren Buffett has a quote. He says, I want to give my children enough money for them to do anything they want, but not enough money to do nothing. Okay? So that's, I think, the perfect way. Where you want to give your kids a push in life so they can go and do well, but not such a big push they just sit at home doing nothing. So this is, generally speaking, not a good option. So in effect, basically, the only option available is the society option. And so society option, so basically about, I think, about 13, 14 years ago when I was thinking about all these things, I said, OK, it sounds like I will have more assets than I can use. There's not going to be any improvement in my life if I just use the money myself. So I can't give it to my kids, so I have to give it to society. So then I started thinking about what is the best way to give it to society. I, I already told you, generally speaking, uh, nonprofits will do a better job of spending the money than the government will. And the, one of the reasons they'll do a better job is that we are very focused on trying to make sure that those assets are used well, right? And that's why we have Dakshina. So, um, so Dakshina was not created to get some business benefit, because there is no business benefit. Uh, it was created to uh, basically see if we can get a multiplier effect, right? Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. And uh, so we are basically, in front of me, I have a bunch of fishermen and fisherwomen. And hopefully, you are learning how to fish really well. Uh, next question. Good morning, sir. I'm Priyanka Gunjar of Army School, Khadki, Maharashtra. My question is, how do you manage to be so grounded, and what's the story about your death date? Thank you. OK, very good. And uh, what is the day I'm going to die? I don't know. Just, but I, you I just know. said that. I just heard that you have a death date fixed. So the, the day I'm going to die is um, uh, June 11th, uh, 2044. So, how much time is left? So we have about, uh, we have 2019 is almost over. So about uh, 24 and a half years, right? So uh, uh, 24.5 years. So not that much time, but not bad. It'll be OK. So, uh, so I think you had, a, you had a question about 
how do I know, how do I know the day I'm going to die? Well, first of all, since I've told you the day I'm going to die, uh, if you hear about my death, please show up. If it's convenient, show up to the funeral. Will you show up to the funeral? I didn't hear too many people saying, yes. Are you going to come to the funeral? Let's say it a little loudly. Yes. 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 All right, that's better. OK. I need at least three, four people to be there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Otherwise, it won't be any fun. So anyway, so why do I have this date, and how do I know this date, right? So my, my birthday is June 12th, 1964, OK? And the death day is one day before I become 80 years old. So I'll be 79 years and 364 days old, and that's when I'll be gone, right? So how do I know that? Uh, so I, I'll give you a slightly long answer on how I know that. And it's actually a very big advantage to know your death date. It's a huge advantage, because planning kar sakte. You know, it's very important to plan. If you don't know your death date, then you can't plan. There's no fun in that. So, uh, so I'm uh, one of the things that I think one of the reasons why we have Dakshana and all these things is I'm uh, I'm part of a a group, uh, kind of like a an organization which is called uh, YPO. Uh, YPO is, uh, the full form is Young Presidents Organization. Presidents like uh, CEOs of companies. And uh, when I joined YPO, uh, this was about, uh, uh, how, how, how far back was it? Yeah, this was about 20, 22 years ago. So 22 years ago, I joined YPO. Um, and uh, it is an organization that's a, completely changed my life. I think if there was no, if I had not joined YPO, there probably would not be a Dakshana. So a lot of things happened in my life because I joined this organization. It's a great organization. And um, so YPO is a kind of unusual organization. What they, what they, the, the members of YPO are uh, running businesses all over the world. So they are uh, basically kind of all uh, leaders of different companies and so on. And it has many chapters all over the world. So every city has a chapter. Pune has a YPO chapter. Mumbai has a YPO chapter. Delhi, all over the world they have chapters. And then within the chapter, they have a concept of something known as a forum. And the forum is uh, 8 to 12 uh, YPO members. So when I joined YPO in, in the US, they put me in a forum with nine other people that I didn't know. And uh, the forum, which is like the 10 of us, we would meet once a month for four hours. And uh, once a year, we would go and retreat for three, four days. Uh, and uh, when, we, when, we, when we meet for the four hours, um, it's a very structured type of interaction. So there's a moderator in the group. And uh, whenever you are talking about different issues and whatever else, um, everything is done very efficiently in, to use the time efficiently. But uh, the, the goal of the organization is to help us become better leaders, better spouses, better fathers or mothers, and so on. So, in YPO, we do a lot of different exercises, um, which, will, which typically are helping uh, expand or think, uh, make us think about things that we normally don't think about. So, and we usually do these exercises when we go on retreat. So one time we, I think this would have been about uh, 15 years ago. So I was on a retreat in Mexico, um, 
I think some, some beach resort in Mexico. And uh, before we went on retreat, we had to do a lot of preparation in terms of different exercises and things that we were going to do there. Mental exercises, not physical exercises. Um, so one of the exercises that we had been told to prepare in ad advance was the following exercise. So at that time I was 40 years old. And what they said is, they said, look, you imagine that you are 80 years old. And imagine that yesterday you died. Okay? And there is a funeral that's taking place, your funeral. And all your friends and family have come to this funeral. And your best friend has been asked to deliver a eulogy. Do you know what a eulogy is? What's a eulogy? Raise your hand if you know what a eulogy is. So eulogy is like someone is just going to uh, talk about the person who died. You know, what they did in life and what they were all about, just some things about the person. So that's called a eulogy. So, so they said that your best friend is going to come up and deliver your eulogy. So the exercise said, pretend that you are your best friend. So they said, you know, aap to mar gaye ho. Aapka best friend abhi aapke baare mein bolne wala hai. You pretend you are your best friend and write the eulogy that the friend is going to deliver about your life, right? And it cannot be more than five minutes. So when you're speaking about the eulogy, it cannot take, eulogy cannot be two hours. People don't have that much patience, five minutes. So, so there were, there were uh, 10 of us that had gone on this retreat in Mexico. We were sitting in a beach. There was a fire. We were sitting around the fire. And then each person for five minutes said their eulogy. And no interruptions. So we heard the first eulogy. Then we heard the second eulogy. And in 50 minutes, I heard about these 10 guys I liked a lot all being dead and uh, their best friends talking about them, right? And then after that, we went for dinner. And then we were able to kind of talk about what we heard. So then the second part of the exercise took place at dinner. And um, so the second part of the exercise was that if you are doing something in your life today which was not mentioned in the eulogy, right? So like in my case, someone said, Monish was this and this, born here, did this, did that, whatever, X, Y, Z, and had so many kids, so many grandkids, blah, 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 and now he's dead, right? If, some, if something was not mentioned in the eulogy about your life, why are you spending time on it, right? So if you think about everything we spend time on uh, in our lives, how many of those things will get mentioned by our friend when we die? Not even 1%, right? Most of the things we work on, or things that we do, we will go watch some movie, we listen to some song, we're talking to some friends, it doesn't make it into the eulogy, right? So, so the second part of the exercise was, look at all the things you said in your eulogy, and think about all the things you spend your time, your time on. Why spend your time on anything that's not in the eulogy? Because if it's not in the eulogy, it's not important, right? So that exercise made me think about many things. So few things I had to do for that exercise. One is when I was writing the eulogy, I was 40 years old. So I had to think about what would happen from 2004 to 2044, because that has not happened for me yet. So I had to think about, OK, how many kids do I have? How many kids are they going to have? When will they get married? What's happening with all the kids and all that, right? And then what's happening to my business? And then what else is going on in life? All these things I have to think about, right? And, um, and so I, I, I realized that um, so many things that we spend time on are just useless, waste of time. Very few things we spend time on are actually relevant. So I said, the second part of the exercise made me think about, I said, yeah, 
if I just look at the things that were mentioned, those are really the important things in life. Whatever is not mentioned is not so important. And uh, so that eulogy exercise led to the thinking that led to the creation of Dakshana. Okay, so it came from that exercise. And since I know the day of death, because they said in the exercise, one day before your 80th birthday, you're dead. So every year what I do is I go to God Google. And I say, God Google, if an Indian man living in America is 55 years old, how many years does he have left to live? And God Google gives an answer. Like now, I think the answer will be around 27, 28 years, maybe 30 years. A little bit more than this time. So anything more than I get past 2044 is a major bonus. That's a gift. That's awesome. But I'm not counting on the gift. So I said, OK, we will plan for this exit date. And we'll plan everything backwards from there, right? So Dakshana was created because I said that I don't want to create Dakshana when I'm 78 years old because I'll have no energy to do anything. You know, it takes time to do this. Well, so I, I wanted to start Dakshana early so that if there are mistakes, problems, issues, whatever is going on, we have time to fix those things. So now, uh, 2019, Dakshana was conceived in 2006. So 13 years, right? And we learned a lot of things in 13 years. And you're a direct beneficiary of a lot of that learning. And uh, so the framing, you know, the framing of knowing this and then working backwards is an important model. And the second model, which is uh, thinking about what is important and not important in life, will also help you go a long ways. So sorry for the long answer. But now you know the date of death. Uh, you know that you're, you already said you're going to show up, which is great. And uh, it kind of sets things in perspective accordingly. Uh, next question. I am Ankit Mato from JNB Bardhan, West Bengal. So I want to ask you, what are your views on caste-based reservation system in India? OK, so what are your views on caste-based reservation system? So my, no, my views are not that important. No, no, but I would like to know your views. What are your views? So, <laughs> I have not seen that much world, so that I can frame my views. Aapka, aapka, what caste are you? I mean, what category do you fall in? It's general. You're general. <laughs> <laughs> you can openly share what you think. Go ahead. So as you know, um, India has, uh, you know, many of you are from the JNV system. The JNVs have a reservation system for scheduled caste, scheduled tribes disabled, women, so on, as do the IITs, right? And, and also, even the, a lot of your medical students, same with many medical government schools and so on. So the reservation system, regardless of what I think about it, is entrenched in our system. Whatever my views on that are, don't matter. It's entrenched in the system. So when, when I look at Dakshana operating in, inside a system which has these reservation systems, there are two ways Dakshana can operate. One way Dakshana can operate is to be blind to reservations. Take the best kids, train them, and let them go take the exam, and we'll see what happens. And in fact, that was the year, that was the way we operated the first year Dakshana was created, 2007. Uh, when we selected the kids, we did not look at their category and so on. The second way Dakshana can operate is to be aware of the reservations and adjust the the acceptances that we go through based on uh, the category and such. If, if our objective at Dakshana is to maximize the input-output ratio, which is we take X kids and we want Y in IITs or medical schools, and we want to maximize the X to Y conversion, we have to be 
sensitive and aware of how the reservations work. If we are blind to it, um, we will severely under-optimize how we are using that system. And so I think Dakshina has to be aware of it. Now, uh, so Dakshina does operate in a system where reservations are entrenched. I'm not the emperor of India who has any control over that, not yet. And, um, and, and we have to operate within that system. And so our objective is that if we take 10 kids, we want six, six to eight of them to go to an IIT or medical school. If we take 10 kids without any, any perspective on the, the category and such, that number will almost become unattainable. It becomes attainable because we are able to leverage uh, the reservation systems and so on, especially since our feeder systems also rely on those, uh, on those reservations. So that's how Dakshina operates. Then let's get to kind of how Monish operates, right? And what does Monish think? So it is absolutely clear if you look at the statistics of per capita income or per household income in India that if you separate them into four categories, general, OBC, SC, ST, those four categories, separate all the households in India, into those four categories, you will generally find correlation where the highest average per capita income is in the general category, then OBC, then SC, and then ST. This is the case today, and it was the case 20 years ago. Now, one of the things that the reservation system has done is there has been a lot of progress for the scheduled casts. So if you look at the per capita incomes or the per household incomes for scheduled caste going back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and the deltas between them and the, the rest, those deltas have narrowed quite a bit because, of, uh, because the reservation systems are not just in schools and colleges, they're also there in jobs and so on. And all of that actually has worked in terms of narrowing the income gap. It has not had a meaningful impact on the scheduled tribes. So the, the data for the scheduled tribes is completely different from the data from scheduled caste. The scheduled tribes have had almost no impact so far. So most of those, uh, those uh, uh, families and those, uh, those individuals have not moved up the way the scheduled caste have. So, I live in the United States. In the United States, we have something known as affirmative action. Affirmative action is the US system of reservations. And the United States had slavery, where they brought in Africans as slaves all the way up to the you know, middle of the 19th century. Right? And so these. Uh, these, these slaves were eventually freed and they joined society. So after 1865 or so, slavery was banned in the US. From then till now, it has been about 160 years, maybe 155 years. And in 155 years, the data is very obvious. African American families in the US, the per capita incomes are significantly lower than white families. Huge difference. And a lot of that difference gets explained by kind of the history of where these people have come from. And so there's a, there's a very rich debate that goes on in the US of is affirm affirmative action good for society or not? So there are lots of people in the US who believe that, you know, like someone said, jo hua, so hua, right? So people say that something happened in the past that was unequal, but now we have no issues. We should not have these 
special, special things and all that. That's one school of thought. The second school of thought is that, no, these people are sitting here. Everyone else is sitting here. We have to do things to lift them up. That's another school of thought. So there are a lot of people on one side. There are a lot of people on the other side. If you ask me, I believe you need affirmative action. Now, affirmative action or reservations have negatives. Okay, let's say I am going to have heart surgery. Do I want a doctor who is scheduled cast coming through the reservation system working on my heart, or do I want a general category doctor who is the best doctor in that area? Which do I want? So, then we are making a doctor of SC. Right? So there's a negative, right? Reservations have a negative. The negative is that we are putting people into roles who are not the best people for those roles. We are not creating the best doctors. We are not creating the best engineers. We are using IIT seats for people. So in an ideal situation in India and in America, what we would have in both cases, if we could make this happen, was not to have, not to have caste-based or category-based reservations, but to have income or economic strata-based reservations, right? But the problem with income-based stratas is very easy to get income statement or income certificate, right? In India, it's a very corrupt system. The corruption on the caste is much lower. So uh, I don't think I have encountered many situations where someone is scheduled tribe or scheduled caste and it's fake. Those reservations, the, I mean, usually what we have found is if someone is SCOST, it's a pretty high probability that that is accurate. But the income data is very problematic, right? So we could, if, 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 if I were the emperor of India, I would try to go to a system which was income-based. But then I would also need to find a way to make sure that their income data is real, right? And even, even a small organization like Dakshana, we try to make sure that the students who are entering our program fit the economic strata that we are looking for, because we are an upliftment program. We are, our objective is not to get the most people to IIT or medical school. Our objective is to lift the most families from poverty. Right? So the IIT, the medical school, are just a tool to, to, to get there. And so the answer to your question is, these are all difficult questions. Okay? And there are no easy answers. If you do reservations, you end up with heart surgeons who are not the best heart surgeons. If you don't do reservations, you end up with polarized society and inequality. So either way, you have got trade-offs. And I think where, where I come out on it is that the way Dakshina has done it is a pretty good medium. Because we try to not take in kids, no matter what category they are, who are making a lot of money. Families are making a lot of money. We try not to do that. Uh, so we, we want to make sure that everyone fits the economic stratas, no matter what category they are. And then we bring in more people from the categories where it's easier to get the seats to have the conversions going on. So that's what we are trying to do here. And that's why we have the system we have. Uh, next question. Good morning, sir. I'm Harshada Gavane. I'm from JNV Aurangabad, Maharashtra. Sir, my question is, how do you enjoy, enjoy in your free time, and what motivates you? You know, the free time may not make it to the eulogy. So should we enjoy? <laughs> should we enjoy? No? What about you? Should we enjoy? Yes? She's saying yes. <laughs> little? Should we enjoy a little bit or a lot? Little bit. Should we enjoy little or a lot? <laughs> enjoy a lot, man. <laughs> There's only 24 years left. What you want is that I should do Chucky Piso <laughs> for next 24 years. Is that what I should do? 
Chucky Piso. Pardon? Not included in eulogy, that's all. No, but forget the eulogy. That's a, such, a, such a depressing thing. No, but what, what I'm saying is that should we enjoy life? Or should we focus on eulogy? <laughs> so, I think that we have to always be excited about life and we always have to enjoy life. And actually, um, it's important to do things in your day job, in your life, which you really enjoy. So if you pursue what you are passionate about in your main job, you will not even work one day in your life, right? That's what we should hope for is, and so my, my objective always is that every day I want to try to spend the day in a manner that I'm really happy about, I'm excited about, and uh, you know, it gives me a lot of enjoyment. So in terms of like free time, so actually I don't really look at life in terms of free time versus not free time because many times I cannot, what I am doing, whether it's work or fun, it gets confusing many times, which I think is a good situation. Like for example, today, you know every year December 26th, I'm over here in Dakshina Valley. I hope you'll come next year. Now, medal Sounds good. So, I'm so, this is supposed to be a work day for me because I'm here, you know, with you guys and all that. But it's a lot of fun. I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be here. If someone told me, would you like to go see some Shah Rukh Khan movie? Aaj to wo sab fail ho rahe but, <laughs> but if someone told me you want to see some Shah Rukh Khan movie or you want to come to talk to Dakshna scholars, what do you think I would say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. More fun, right? You know, Shah Rukh, you know, Dil Wale Dulhaniya Wale Din Chale Gai. You know, so that's okay. So anyway, so the things I like to do, um, well, let me take a step back. So one of the things, I went through some psychological testing maybe around 20 years ago where they tried to understand what my preferences are, things that I really like to do, don't like to do, what I'm good at, not good at, and so on. So what they told me in that, testing at the end, they gave me my owner's manual, which is very useful. Uh, they said that for me particularly, I, I like to play mathematical games. So we can, uh, we can erase the date. But you know, so, so these guys 20 years ago, they were very useful because they helped me understand who I was. So what they said is that you like to play mathematical games. But they said that you like to play mathematical games which have some conditions. So the first condition is outcome has to depend uh, mostly on me. Okay, so what I mean by that is like, let's say for example, I'm playing hockey or soccer or cricket. Does the outcome depend on me? No, it depends on the team, right? So no matter how good Virat Kohli is, the team has to be good to win, right? So I, I would not do, I would not be optimizing based on where my personality is to be on a cricket team because there'd be two problems being on a cricket team, even though I like playing cricket. Number one, it's not mathematical. Thoda math hai, jada math nahi hai, okay? And number two, it's not individual, it's a team, team endeavor. And then the second thing they told me is, I like to play games I know I can win. So they said, they said Monish, you like to play games where outcome depends on you. And the second is that you have figured out that this kind of game I can probably win. And so if these two conditions are met, and if it's a mathematical game, then the chances are I'm hitting the bullseye. So if I look at kind of my, 
my life. So one is that I run something known as Pabrai Investment Funds. So this is my, my business. This business is very mathematical. There's a qualitative side to it, but there's a lot of math in it, which is great. I like math. And the second is outcome almost completely dependent on me. It's not a team. It's, it's uh, mostly me. So I love this. In fact, this is supposed to be my work. But when I'm at work, I think I'm just playing a game. Right? So one is I like Pabrai funds. The second is I play bridge. Have you guys heard of bridge? How many people heard of bridge as the, the game, the card game? Anyone heard of bridge? One person, that's it. Have you played bridge? No? OK. So when you go to IIT or med school, there will be a bridge club, for sure. Join the bridge club. Now, you know, some of you are PCB, and some of you are PCM, right? PCB wale kitne hai? Raise your hand if you're PCB. We have a heavy dose of PCB. And what about PCM? We have very few PCMs. So, how many of you who are PCB like math? Oh, so we have some mathematicians in the PCBs. That's good. So, bridge is a, is a very fun game. It's a card game. Um, and it's, uh, it's a game that takes about 15 minutes to learn. And you cannot master it in your lifetime. So, if you learn the game and then you spend your whole life 10 hours a day playing the game, you will not master the game because it has got so many different kind of things that you can keep learning and doing with it. So it's an endless pursuit. So I play about maybe five hours, five hours a week of bridge. I hope whichever idiot friend of mine delivers the eulogy, make sure he mentions the bridge. <laughs> OK, I'll, I have 24 years to talk to the person. Maybe I'll write the eulogy myself for the person just to make it easy for them. OK, boss, ye use kar lena. So bridge is important, five hours a week. And then the third thing is I play blackjack. How many of you have heard, black, have heard of blackjack? Raise your hand. Zero. That's good. Because blackjack is a game you play in casinos. And if you are, don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money. But I'm good at blackjack. I make money when I play blackjack. Bridge has no money. This is just for enjoyment. And Pabrai Funds is enjoyment plus a lot of money. Both. So one does both. One is pure enjoyment. And the third, blackjack is kind of more, uh, it's kind of just more, uh, not as much fun. I would say bridge is more fun than blackjack. But basically, so I probably, blackjack, maybe in a, in a year I'm playing, I don't know, like 50 hours or 100 hours or something. I'll, I'll make sure the guy in my eulogy mentions the blackjack too. So, so first of all, I spend my time on mathematical games. And it doesn't matter whether it's work or not, they're all fine. Then, you know, I like to play some sports. So I like to do bicycling. Uh, usually I'm bicycling about like 15, 20 kilometers a week. And then I play racquetball. Have you heard of racquetball? How many of you heard of racquetball? You know, I told the colonel, okay, I have a dream that there are racquetball courts in Dakshina Valley. And nobody really is very interested in that. But one day we will put racquetball, racquetball courts here. Now, we can't put that many people to play racquetball, but then, then we'll give some option. Instead of PT or yoga, you can go play racquetball. And uh, you might enjoy that. But it's a court, court game, like squash. Have you heard of squash? Yes. So squash, racquetball, like the American version of squash. So racquetball, I usually play three times a week. 
Monday, Wednesday, Friday, bicycling once or twice a week, uh, bridge two times a week, blackjack whenever I'm away. Pabrai funds is almost daily, every day I'm playing those games, that's always fun. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think beyond that, uh, I don't know whether there's much else that I do regularly, which is, I, I read a lot, which I enjoy a lot. So reading is a lot of fun. But those are the things I, uh, I like to do. Next. I am Shunale Malakar from Janbe Ahalakandi, Assam. And my question is, what had inspired you to start? So one is I already told you, I did not have any choice, right? There were only two choices. Give it to the kids. And I told them when they were very young, I'm sorry to break the bad news to you, but there's nothing coming to you. And I think they're OK with it. They're fine. So, uh, so the, the, once I knew that I had to give the money away, then I had to figure out how to give the money away, right? Kind of what to do and what kind of, uh, uh, I mean, I, I mean, like what, what type of things we can do in an NGO that might be good. And um, so actually, I have, a, I have a cousin. And I think this is going back about 15 years or so. Uh, no, more than 15 years, I'm sorry. So uh, 25 years. Yeah, so I think when I was 30 years old at the time. So my, uh, my cousin had just finished BCom in Mumbai, and he had no job. And my parents said, you have your cousin brother, he's got no job. Can you see if you can help him? So at that time, I was running an IT services company. So I knew that if the guy has got some IT skills, software skills, he can get some good job. And uh, I, knew, I knew this small company in Delhi. Uh, like, there were like three, four guys. And they were very, very good, but they were very small. So I said, listen, uh, would you be willing to hire my cousin and give him a job with no pay? So you can make him do whatever you want, uh, but to keep him for a year or two, and you don't need to pay him. So they, they said, uh, we can do that, but there's a couple of conditions. So they said, first, uh, send him with a desk, a chair, and a computer. So he needs to come with his own desk, own chair, and own computer. And the second, they said, is that when he's not using the computer, we can use it. So they were very tight on cash, and they were just trying to build the company. So for them, it was a big deal. if. Someone came with a computer. At that time, I think computers used to cost like two lakhs or something. It was pretty expensive. So I said, sure, no problem. Sounds good. So I bought a computer and desk chair. We sent him. And these guys were really good. So they, uh, they uh, and then I got him enrolled at an NIIT course. And uh, a year later, he went back to Mumbai. And he had like 20 job offers. Everybody wanted to hire him because he had picked up all these skills, right? And so when I thought about it, and for the one year he lived with my parents, there wasn't really much expense. And so when I thought about what it cost to get him converted from zero to hero, the cost was very small. He still had the computer. He took it with him. you know. So there wasn't much expense involved. And now uh, he's, he's settled in, the, in, in London, makes a lot of money, does really well. His life is set very well. So I saw the kind of trajectory transformation it did, uh, where if you can just make some tweaks to what the person is doing, right? And, and then when I was looking at Dakshina and I was looking at you know, what we should do, I ran into Super 30. You know, all of you are familiar with Super 30. And uh, so I said, OK, you know, this program Anand Kumar runs is really good, because he takes these poor kids. He spends about eight, nine months, 10 months on them. And I visited him in, um, 
March 2007 for the first time. Now, now he's a good friend. And at that time, it was costing him about, because he was providing room and board for all the kids and the coaching. It was costing him at that time about eight lakhs, eight or nine lakhs a year to take care of 30 kids. You know, all the food, the place he was renting for them, and then all the, all the coaching, because he was paying some other, other people to do coaching as well. So it was eight, nine lakhs a year. And uh, so I said, wow, it's only about 30,000 per student. And, uh, and his mother was doing all the cooking, so they, they, it was very low cost operation. So I said 30,000 per student and then they go to IIT and then they get good job is really good. Input output ratio is really good. And so I told Anand, listen, uh, instead of doing 30, why don't you do 300? And I'll write you a check every year. And he said, no, Mergo, I want to keep it at 30. So, and I don't want any outside funding. And uh, so I said, okay, then um, do you have any problem if we copy your model? He said, no, this is really good. Please go ahead, you can copy the model. And so that's what we did. We took that model and we copied it and we were able to scale it and then Dakshna Valley got created. And uh, here you are. So that's how and why uh, Dakshana got going. Next. My name is Aishwarya Mani. I am from Jayami Pune, Maharashtra. So my question is, why, why all peoples are not rich? Means, why poverty develop in this world? Because of this poverty, children do not get chance for their development. Only few students are there which get help from Dakshana and other institutes. But rest of them are still fighting for the education. So this poverty is boon or curse for student. Is money everything in there? Thank you for the question. How far is your home? Maharashtra. And you're from Pune, right? Yes, sir. So how far? Uh, five, five hours. Five hours? Yes, sir. It's pretty far. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Have a seat. Closer than most of the rest of you. So, uh, Sharmila, do we still have power? Yeah. How, how many days a week we don't have three-phase power? So last year also I asked the same question. Last year she was sitting on that side, I think, but the answer was the same. So three days a week, there's no three-phase power. So let me explain why we have poverty. And also let me explain why poverty is not necessary. Let's start with electricity, then I'll explain to you uh, the, the reason why we are poor. So, this area, Pune, we are in an industrial belt. There are lots of industries here, uh, auto manufacturing, chemicals. There's a number of very significant industries in Pune district. And you cannot have efficiency of an industrialized place if you don't have power. Okay, so if I set up a factory in Pune and I hire a fa factory worker and I want to run that factory, for example, 24 by 7 by 365. I want to have three shifts and I want the factory to run all the time so that I can make maximum use of that factory. But for 72 hours in a week, there's no power. So I cannot run for three days. 40% of the time, the factory has to be idle. Then when I am, when I am uh, hiring a person, so someone comes to get a job and they are a welder, right? Skilled, skilled uh, labor. So the welder says, uh, my current job is paying 25,000 per month. So I'll tell him, look, you're working five, six days a week. I'm only going to use you for four days, so I can only pay you 15,000. Is he going to join? No. What he's going to tell me is, I don't care whether you use me for one day or six days, you have to pay more than 25,000, right? So all my labor costs on a per hour basis is higher than any other place which has electricity all the time. So 
if India needs to develop, it cannot have a situation where there's any part of the country where there's no power, ever. Because power is like the absolute basic lifeline, right? So why is it that Pune does not have power for three days a week, right? So the reason it doesn't have power three days a week, so we have a power plant, okay? And India has many power plants, and they produce lots of power. In fact, we have so many power plants in India that many power plants are idle. So on one side, we have no power for three days in Pune. On the other side, we have power plant not being run. Why is that happening? Both are stupid things going on at the same time. So we have a power plant, and this power, power plant generates power, and, and, and then it gives it to a power company. So let's call it Pune Power, right? So Pune Power is buying power from the power plant. And then Pune Power is giving the power to many customers, right? So there are agricultural customers. There are commercial customers. And then there's residential customers. So different customers are getting power. So what they have done is agricultural customers, so the power plant is charging Pune power three rupees per unit for power. Okay, so they're saying how much power, as much power as you want, I'll give you at three rupees. There is so much power available that there, nobody needs to cut power. But the thing is, agriculture is paying, let's say, one, one rupee per unit. They are subsidized and paying below. Commercial is paying six rupees per unit. And residential is paying, let's say, four rupees per unit. And then also, there is stolen power. Right? You heard of stolen power? Yes. What is the price there? Zero, Zero per unit. Right? So this is what is happening on this side. So when, when they're giving the power over here to the residential customers that sometimes at no, sometimes the power is free or it's very low, they can run the pump all night. Nobody cares. No one cares to save power. It's so cheap or it's free. And when all this money is coming back to them, this total money coming to them is not enough to pay for the power. Because so much of it is going here and here below the cost. Right? So the, the government has told the power company, you have to give it at this price. And this is vote bank. A lot of votes are over here. That's why I said, I need to be the emperor. I cannot be prime minister, emperor, above the prime minister. Right? So this is, this is vote bank going on here. And this is also vote bank. Right? This and this has hardly any votes. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares about them. So how do you fix the power situation in India? Very simple. All you have to do is take away any input from here and tell the power company, charge whatever you want to whoever you want. We don't care, okay? There is no restriction on you of any kind of who you charge how much to. And if someone is not paying for the power, you can shut the power off. Do teen notice bhezo do teen mahine ke liye, then no payment has come, turn off the power. That's how it works in the US, right? If I don't pay my power bill, in two months there'll be no power coming to me. So if they do that, what will happen is the power company will make sure everyone is paying more than three rupees per unit, right? And they will also make sure, and also we'll make this a private company. 
and we'll make multiple power companies, so they compete with each other. So if I want power in Dakshina Valley, there are three companies I can buy power from, right? Not one company. And I'll talk to all three companies, just like a mobile service. You know, why do I have Geo? Because it's cheaper than Airtel, right? So I'll have multiple power companies giving power. Will we have power cut in Pune? Power cut will be gone. The second problem is that this commercial six rupees, so when the Pune manufacturing plant is producing some auto part, and when the same auto part is produced in Indonesia, where the power is at three rupees per unit, and here is a six rupees per unit, and there the labor is working six days a week, and here the labor is working four days a week, all these differences are there, the part made in Pune costs more. It cannot be exported because it's not competitive. So the moment you take the price down, the welder can now work six days a week. He's productive. The, power, the plant is running all the time. Everything is fine. So the only thing required to fix it is fix this guy, right? But can that guy get fixed? Can it be fixed? Can we triple the power rate to agricultural? What will happen if we triple the rate? More protests than CAA, right? Jo CAA ka protest hai, usse to bahut jada protest hoega, right? So what we have to do is we can still get it done. You can do it gradually. So what you can say is that every year increase it a little bit and educate the people and uh, teach them power saving techniques and all. But you have to get there. There's no way you can build an industrial society without, without taking care of, of, these, of these issues. These are very, very important issues to take care of. So um, the reason India is poor is because we as a country have certain competitive advantages. And what we have to do as a country to be a rich country is fully harness those advantages. So for example, India has an advantage in IT services, okay? It provides IT services to companies all over the world, right? When it provides those services all over the world, like TCS, Wipro, Infosys, and all of that, is there any government subsidy? No, those companies are competing in the world on their own, right? In fact, they are competing even with power issues. They are still competing. And they are winning contracts all over the world because India produces a lot of IT professionals and it puts them to work in an efficient way and it makes all of it work very well. Right, so, but I'll give you another example of why we are poor, right? And this goes back to David Ricardo and his theory of competitive advantage. So, up, when you are in third year medical or IIT, you can read on David Ricardo and you can read on Adam Smith and it will become clear to you why India is poor. So let me give the example of um, sugarcane farming. Anyone here from UP? We have a few people from UP. Anyone from farming background in UP? And anyone growing sugarcane? No, one, one person growing sugarcane. So how many acres does your family have? I don't know in Bihar. Pardon? I don't know in acres. OK, so bigas kitne bigas hai? Five. Five. And sugarcane grow hota hai? OK, please have a seat. And after I finish talking, please don't hate me. OK? <laughs> I don't hate you. I'm just going to give you reality. So. 
when sugarcane is produced in Brazil, so Brazil is the country that produces the most sugarcane in the world. And the way the climate is in Brazil, the soil conditions and all of that, the cheapest place in the world to grow sugarcane is Brazil. And India does not allow the import of Brazilian sugar or sugarcane. Banned here. Okay? So these numbers are not correct, but they are just to give you an, uh, an example. So let's say, for example, in Brazil, it costs 30, I mean, Brazilian sugar cane, if we brought it into India, it would be, let's say, 30 rupees a kilo, for example. And Indian sugar cane, which is produced in India, is 100 rupees a kilo. Okay? So if you had a world where India did not have any restrictions on the import or export of sugar and sugar cane, would we be producing sugarcane in India? So what the government has done is, number one, they've restricted import of Brazilian sugarcane, right? The second thing they have done, they have put MSP, minimum support price, which means they're telling the far farmer that when you grow the sugarcane, you are guaranteed minimum price, no matter what the market price is, MSP here. MSP causes a distortion in the market. Just like we saw in power, when you start fiddling with market distortion, uh, the rates of power, you cause market distortions. And anytime you cause market distortions, you are going to create inefficiencies. So when India produces sugarcane, it subsidizes the cost of the fertilizers, subsidizes the cost of the power. It, even with all those subsidies, it provides a minimum support price. Uh, still, the cost to produce the sugar, sugar cane is higher than Brazil, just because Brazil is so efficient at producing sugar cane. And so when India produces this sugar cane at this high price, can it be exported? No, because anywhere else in the world, they'll just import Brazilian sugarcane over Indian sugarcane because it's cheaper. And so what ends up happening is that uh, there's large amounts of acreage in India used for sugarcane production, very large amount. And nobody can remove the import duty because they will be out of power very soon. Right? And, and uh, no one can get rid of the subsidies, and no one can do anything with the MSP. Now, if you consider a world which Ricardo talked about, which is, let's say we said to the sugarcane industry that we are going to eliminate, in a phase manner over five or 10 years, all the tariffs and and duties on imported sugarcane, and we're going to get rid of MSP, and we're going to get rid of all subsidies on the production of sugarcane. Okay? What would happen in that case is that India's sugarcane industry would disappear, right? So then the next thing that people will say is you have created a lot of unemployment, and you have created all these problems now by doing this. That's true. But what will happen is that in a capitalist system, the system will adjust. And it will adjust where the, what happens with the farmers who are, make, who are growing sugarcane today is they look at the MSP and they look at all the economics and it makes sense to grow sugarcane. If they cannot grow sugarcane, they will look at the range of other crops and look at what other crop will make sense to be grown. Right? They can grow other things as well. They may also look at entirely different professions. So the farmer may tell his son, listen, I used to tell you not to pay attention in school because you can be a sugarcane farmer. That can, that's not possible. Please study hard. Become an IT professional. Because sugarcane mein kuch nahi banne wala hai. Jaise aap farming chhod ke kahi aur ja rahe ho na. So there will be a transformation. So now if I compare if I compare the sugarcane industry to 
the shrimp farming industry. Everyone knows what shrimp is? Jinga? OK. So Andhra Pradesh, how many here from Andhra Pradesh? Anyone in shrimp farming? No, because they are too wealthy. That's why. So anyway, India is the number one shrimp farming country in the world. Like Brazil is to sugarcane, India is to shrimp farming. So we are producing, growing, growing shrimp in these ponds is a very specialized activity. And uh, Andhra Pradesh, with the climate and big coastline, soil conditions, is perfect, perfect place in the world to do shrimp farming. So when you produce shrimp in Andhra Pradesh, the cost per kilogram of shrimp produced there is lower than the next best place, which is Thailand. Thailand used to be the best place in the world to produce shrimp, but Andhra Pradesh, in the last 15 years, has killed Thailand. Not because of any government subsidy. Everything. So these guys who are doing shrimp farming in Andhra Pradesh, they used to be rice farmers. And they used to be on a bicycle. Now they are in SUV. OK? Wo bicycle se, motorcycle se SUV pe aa gaye hain. And bade ghar ban gaye hain. So they are all doing very well. And all their kids are in IT, OK? Or maybe even going back into shrimp farming. So shrimp farming is like IT services for India. We have a strong competitive advantage. So if you let the free market system work, what will happen is that India as a country has advantages compared to the rest of the world. We have to let those advantages show themselves. Now, the other thing that happens is that when we do not allow the import, import of Brazilian sugar or Brazilian sugar cane, what do you think Brazil does to our shrimp? Do they allow our shrimp to come in? No. They sugar. shrimp. IT services. We generic drugs, we don't need all these things. Now, what, what India can do is they can go sit down with Brazil and say, hello, Mr. Brazil, nice to meet you. And uh, we have a deal for you. We're going to open up our markets for sugarcane. We want you to open our markets for everything from India. They'll say, of course, we've been waiting for 30 years for you to come. So yes, we'll open it up, <laughs> right? So what will happen is the Shrimp farmers in Andhra will do even more business because new countries got opened up. And Brazilian farmers will do well because more sugar will come to India. It's a big market. And the land, the land that is being used in India for sugarcane farming will get redeployed. It will get redeployed in a way that we cannot predict. But the market system will find the best use for that land. And it will, the adjustment period is a difficult period. So while you're doing all of this, while I'm doing all of this as the emperor of India, what I will also do is I will create a safety net, social safety net. So I'll tell all the sugarcane farmers that, look, depending on the size of your household, I will give you 4,000 rupees per month per family member for 10 years because you have suddenly lost your ability to make money, right? We'll just do a direct DBT, direct benefit transfer. So we give the, so the person was making some money, they will not be on the street. They will get some money, but so what you do is you create a safety net, social safety net for all Indians, where if you go below a certain point, the government comes in and gives you a direct benefit transfer. But you let all the activities be driven by market forces. And if you let the activities be driven by market forces, we will become a country which will really surprise you because you have not seen this. We will become much more prosperous than we are today. So poverty 
is not necessary. Poverty is there because I don't blame the people in power. Because the people in power have no ability to make these changes because if they try to make these changes, they'll be thrown out, right? And then the next person coming in knows, don't mess with show again. In fact, if they mess with show again, I don't think they'll just be thrown out. I think they'll be assassinated, okay? Because all those guys will come and just shoot them, okay? So they're not, it, they will not even survive till the next election. They'll be gone before then. Same thing with the power situation. So these are very tough issues to solve. But I'll give you the example. There's a, there's a country in, uh, in Latin America, Chile. Have you heard of Chile? Yes, sir. Do you know where Chile is? So, southern western coast of Latin America. Thin country, right? Running long country on the side, right? So Chile, so most of Latin America does not have a high standard of living. Probably for similar reasons to India. They have all these controls and different things going on. About, I don't know, maybe about 30 years ago, Chile went through a military coup. A military general took power. Augustine Pinochet. Okay, he took power throughout the government and he ran the country with an iron fist. Okay, so anyone who was in opposition, politician opposing him, all that, either in jail or fired, firing squad, just shot them. And he asked a bunch of econ economists from University of Chicago in the US to come to Chile, and he told them, I have complete power tell me what to do, and I want my country to become rich. So those economists said, ye to bhot simple problem hai, because you are now the emperor with unlimited power. So they gave him all the things to do. Like I told you, get rid of power subsidy, get rid of the sugar cane subsidy. So, and anyone is unhappy, shoot the guy, right? So this is what Chile did about three decades ago. The per capita standard of living in Chile now is number one in Latin America. It is the richest country in Latin America. And the standard of living is at least three or four times the next country. Not only are they the riches, they're riches by a significant amount. Okay? So for me, Augustine Pinochet is a hero. He lifted all those people. Yeah, so a few hundred people got shot and a few thousand people went to prison, but millions of people got lifted from poverty, right? But that's not how the Chilean people see it. So eventually, they removed him from power. My hero got thrown out. Then he was extradited from, I think in Spain where he was living, brought to Chile, put on trial, and then put life in prison. And then he died in prison, okay? So if I talk to Chileans about Augustine Pinochet, it'll be like the reservation issue, okay? Some people will be like me. They're saying he was a very good person. And some people will say he was a really bad person. Look at all the things he did. But could Pinochet do what he did without using the gun and using the jails? Could he do what he did? No. So yeah, humans are very strange. Hai. Aap kehte ho Aishwarya ke poverty nikal do. Main to aap, please keep sitting. Main to bata raha hon aapko kaise poverty nikalna hai. So, shall we remove poverty? No. Now you don't, do you want to remove poverty or not? How many of you here want to remove poverty? Please raise your hand. And how many of you want to use Pinochet methods to remove poverty? 
poverty is affecting hundreds of millions of people, right? But this is the problem, right? So the thing is, Churchill used to say, democracy is the worst system except for all the others, okay? Probably one of the worst ways to run a country is a democracy. It's terrible. I believe in democracy, okay? I don't want to be an emperor. I just want to play mathematical games, okay? <laughs> I have no desire to be an emperor. Emperor is too much headache. So, so the solutions are simple, but they're not easy. They're very complicated. And India will not be able to, so if I look at a country like Singapore, and I look at a country like India, in 1950, the per capita GDP of Singapore was less than India. And now the per capita GDP of Singapore is highest in the world, amongst the highest. How did they go from there to there? Because Singapore did not have a democracy. They had Lee Kuan Yew. Now Lee Kuan Yew was more smarter than Pinochet. He didn't go fire people here and there, but he made sure everyone fell in line. He ruled with a pretty strong iron fist. And Singapore became uh, a leading country. So actually, if, you, if I ask the people in Singapore, which is completely different from Chile, that what do you think of Lee Kuan Yew? They will all say he's a hero, okay? But Lee Kuan, there's not that much difference between Lee Kuan Yew and Augustine Pinochet. They both had the same objective. In the case of Pinochet, because he came up the military ranks, uh, he, he knew that if he goes with an easy approach, he will not be able to get where he needs to get to. And so actually he put the country first. He was not a corrupt guy. He put the country first and he made the country rise. So I, I find India to be very frustrating because so many things need to get fixed. I mean, I would say that the, like the sugarcane issue, uh, you can do it in steps. You know, you can put in minimum, you can put in a safety net first so everyone has got the basics covered. And then you need to kind of gradually, maybe over a 10-year period or 15-year period, take down the tariffs and take down the MSPs, take down the subsidies, but make sure that you give enough time for the economy to adjust. And, and what will end up happening is we will end up with a bunch of industries like IT and like generic drugs and like shrimp farming where India has competitive advantage. And we send those goods and services all around the world. So, sorry for the long answer. Next question. Good morning, sir. I am Triti Smita, Bodo of JNB, Kamrup, Assam. My question to you is, since you have surveyed great helping hands towards economically weaker students and provided many opportunities, by such great motivation, I also want to initiate myself for such contribution. But the question is, from where should such initiation begin? And how to induce such initiation from people to people of India so that in reality we can create a poverty-free, rape cases-free, superstition-free, still in some cases a pure free India. So, you know, Gandhi used to say, um, be the change you wish to see. Be the change, right? So actually, it's very simple. Hai. Uh, you can just start with focusing on changing the life of one person, right? I mean, it could be someone in your village or your, uh, your community, and you can do it after you finish. Abhi to are busy ho. And next few years you may be busy, but once you are finishing IIT or medical school, you, it would not be hard for you to maybe do something for a village school or a few students or a hundred students or something like that. And it can be different, different things. You can do healthcare, education, environment, a lot of things are there. So the, the key is, I think, start small, start somewhere where you can get something going, and then just keep learning and going from there. And uh, one step at a time, and you can, you can get there. Uh, next question. I'm Harsha Aliwari, 
from JNV Jargao, Maharashtra. And my question is, is there anything from God or spirituality which made you to go through all the difficulties in your life? Sir, can you share your experience with us? My religious belief system is agnostic. So agnostic means that maybe there's some higher power, but I don't know who or what it is. And uh, most of the time, I don't really pray to a higher power. I only turn religious on Diwali for a few hours, you know, just to make sure Lakshmi and Ganesh are happy with me, you know. And uh, they, they, are, they are good. I like them. Especially Ganesh is my favorite. So, so religion is very good. I think it can help a lot of people get a great moral, moral grounding. For me, what has worked is to look at uh, heroes and gurus, some of them who are dead, but they're all human, they're not gods, and to learn from them, right? So that's what has worked for me. So you can learn a lot from the eminent dead. You know, we've had so many great humans globally in the past, uh, like Lee Kuan Yew would be a good example, uh, uh, that we can learn from. And I think a country like India has a lot of advantages when you start looking at that. So I think for me personally, what has worked is to be what I would call a continuous learning machine, which is you know keep reading and learning. And the second is to um, basically focus on what learn from what people have already figured out. A lot of people have already figured out many things. So for example, um, the, the Indian government, I think the people in the highest position, the Indian government, I think they are very familiar with Lee Kuan Yew, Pinochet, and all these models. They know these models. Uh, the problem is they face stumbling blocks in how to execute those models. But you can still get there, but I, and I wish they would do more of that. Um, so I think that's the thing. For me, the, uh, the role models and having, having people who you look up to, and those people that you look up to can be dead, perfectly fine. Uh, they have said a lot of things in the past which is available in writing to us, and we can use that. So that's what I, I focus on and what I try to learn from. Uh, next question. I'm Kalani Sate from January, Vashim, Maharashtra. Sir, I can really imagine your love for India with Dakshna program, but you have cho chosen to live in California instead of India. May I know the reason behind this? Yeah, please have a seat. The, the reason for living in California is that, uh, well, I have, I have now not lived in India for the last 39 years. And for all practical purposes, the United States is my home. You know, my closest friends are there. A lot of my close family is there. And, and uh, I have a dual love, right? I have a love for India. I have a love for the US as well. And uh, so, so I. Uh, I just, I'm not trying to, you know, be a, I would say, a role model or something. I just go with what is easy for me. And what is easy for me is uh, it's, it's great to be in India. It's even better to be in California. And so that's where we are. And uh, that's what we do. So the cycling is definitely better. You know, dedicated bike paths. We'll get there someday in Dakshina Valley. Uh, next question. I'm Gornamai Pangi from JNB Koraput, Odisha. Sir, you are one of the most successful business person of India, and knew the economic condition of India very well. So my question to you is, why didn't you open the paradise of Dakshina for the commerce student who are directly involved in the resource management of a country? Thank you, sir. So I told you about my cousin who did BCom, and then nobody wanted to give any job to him. So. One of the things we wanted to look at when we were doing Dakshina is we, we need to focus on high potential individuals which the job market recognizes. 
And the job market recognizes engineers. They engin recognize doctors. Um, if someone is really good at literature or commerce, that will not get recognized immediately. Now, one of the things that I'm also happy about with Dakshna is that uh, more and more Dakshna scholars, after they have finished their degree, they are looking at IAS. Some have already joined IAS, et cetera. And uh, so they are getting into government. And, and hopefully they will start making some policy changes. I hope they study Lee Kuan Yew. That'll be a good thing for them to study. And uh, so I think, I think our body of alums will get there. But I think that if we, uh, you know, the, you probably know the story of in the Mahabharata of Arjun, where, you know, Dronacharya is asking them to, you know, shoot the eye of the of the fish, right, or of the bird. I've, I get which one is this fish or bird? Bird, yeah. So the eye of the bird, right? And one by one, all the different princes they tell him all the things they're seeing. He tells them to sit down, and he only asks Arjuna to shoot the eye of the bird. Focus is very important. So if we really want to do well in Dakshana. We have to be very focused. And for a very long time, we only focused on the IITs. And recently, we expanded that focus to medical because there was a lot of commonality, right? Uh, the PNC is the same. I think when we, if we go into something like commerce or the arts, there is a lot of things there that are completely different from what we are doing here. And I am not confident that we have the factors for success. So we have to stay focused and we have to do things that we think uh, work well. But the second thing that can happen is, at some point, you can take care of the commerce students. So I'll leave it to you. Is it okay? All right, next question. I am Khilesh Bande from Jainvi Dhamtari, Chhattisgarh. Sir, being an elder son of middle class family, it is my responsibility to uplift the present condition of my family. But thinking about my family's problem, I get disturbed. How can I manage this? Thank you. OK. Uh, well, I would say that if you talk openly to your friends, you will find that everyone has problems. So who doesn't have problems with the family? Please raise your hand. See, nobody has raised their hand. Everyone is having problems. Do you have some problems? Yes? See, there you go. So families, everyone has problems. That's the nature of families. Uh, I think what you have to do is you have to understand that in the situation you're in right now, there is very little you can do to help your family. OK, almost anything you try to do today is not going to be helpful. So the best thing you can do for your family is do well in this program, do well in college, and put it out of your mind till you at least get to being around 22 years old. You know, 21, 22 years old, when you've finished your college, then you can start looking at what's going on. And I think your family, many of your families also realize that. They also realize that Today, you are not in a situation where even if you try to help, there's not much help you can provide. But in a few years, you'll be able to provide a lot of help. And I know that many of the problems are not financial. They are non-financial problems. But regardless of the nature of the problem, the bottom line is that you are not able to deal with that today. The second thing, which is a very important skill in life, rationality is a very important um, advantage in life. So you can be very rational, or you can be very emotional. And generally speaking, a uh, high degree of emotions is not going to be helpful to you in life. Uh, extreme rationality is going to help you a lot in life. 
So another thing that is very detrimental in life is to engage in self-pity. So self-pity is a very bad trait to get into, saying, mere paas ye sab problem hai, mere, mere ko ye, ye sab bother kar raha hai. You have to rise above all that. So do not engage in self-pity. It's just a downward spiral. And do not get emotionally upset because that's also a downward spiral. So what you really have to be is just be rational saying, look, uh, and you have to be very direct with your family members that today the best thing for everyone is to let me do my thing. One of the advantages you have here in Dakshina is you are not with your families every day, right? So hopefully they can mask some of the stuff from you where you don't get to know about it out of sight, out of mind. Hopefully that can be one possibility, but there's really very little you can do today. And so I would say, you know, we have to learn to compartmentalize. That's a good trait for us to have, where we all have many things going on, but you have to zoom in, like Arjuna, on the focus that you need to have. Get that done. Be a karma yogi, and then go from there. Uh, next question. I am Mohit from Jain Vijayaparpur, Delhi. Second, my question is: Which song you prefer, Hindi or English? So uh, I have a lot of good Hindi music I like, Urdu music, and English as well, and also some other languages. So I am a big fan of Jagjit Singh. He died too young. And I'm a big fan of Ghalib. And I'm a big fan of uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, Rahat Fateh Ali Khan, and uh, once in a while some Bollywood stuff. But I also like a lot of English music. And uh, like how many of you like Michael Jackson? We have some Michael Jackson fans. Pretty good. Maybe next time we can play one of the Michael Jackson fans here, <laughs> or videos here. So all of the above, you know, depends on the mood. And uh, we can kind of take it from there. Next question. This is Namita of Janvi Bida, Karnataka. Why have you started Dakshana 2.0? Which... I'm sorry, say it again. Why have you started Dakshana 2.0 version? OK, please have a seat. So uh, thoda lamba answer hai, but they denge thoda lamba answer aapko. So uh, there's, uh, you know, one of the things I learned from Warren Buffett, which helped me uh, do well in life and also be able to set up Dakshina and all, is um, I, I learned from uh, Buffett uh, the power of compounding. And I know some of you or many of you are not PCM students, but even if you're not PCM students, thoda power of compounding jana acha hai. It may help you in life. So, so this is one of the most important. There are only two things Warren Buffett figured out. He figured out power of compounding when he was 10 years old. And, uh, and it was a big advantage for him in life. So I think you guys might know the story, the, like the guy who invented the game of chess. And the king in that kingdom became an addicted player of chess. And he was so happy with the inventor, he said, ask for any reward and I'll give it to you. So he said that I don't want much. I just want you to put one grain of rice on the first, first square of the chess board, and then two grains on the second, uh, second square, four grains on the third square, and keep doubling the grains and till the 64th square. And that's all I want. And uh, so the king got kind of upset with him. He said, I wanted to give you all these things. You just want a bunch of rice. He said, yeah, I just want a bunch of rice. So he told his treasurer, give him his rice and get him out of my court. So after a few days, the king asked the treasurer why he had not finished the job. He said, sir, uh, it took us a while to run the calculation. But we don't have the rice. 
So the king was very upset. He said, what do you mean you don't have the rice? He says, we don't have that much rice in the whole kingdom to give him. So, you know, like, you know, the first square is one grain plus two grains plus four grains, all the way to two to the power of 63, right? In the 64th square. What is this equal to? Ye to bhot easy sawal hai. Much easier than your JE questions. What is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32 all the way to? Because, you know, this is, uh, let me make it easier for you. 2 to the power 0 plus 2 to the power 1 plus 2 to the power 2 plus 2 to the power 63. What's that equal to? This is uh, 2 to the power 64 minus 1. Okay? You can work it out later how I got that. But 2 to the power 64 minus 1 grains of rice, if I convert that into kilograms, and then I convert it based on the price of the rice, it is about, this is about $300 trillion. And $300 trillion is just about the wealth of the entire planet. Not just rice, if I include all the land and buildings and gold and money everyone has in the whole world, that's 300 trillion. So that's what the guy asked for, okay? So, so one of the things that Warren Buffett figured out and what Einstein said, Einstein said that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world, right? And the, so, what he, so for example, let's say I have uh, one lakh rupees, okay? And let's say, for example, this one lakh rupees is increasing at 26% per year. Some bank is giving me very high interest rate, 26%. Okay, so in three years, this will be approximately doubled. 1.26 times 1.26 times 1.26, it'll be about approximately two. So what happens in three years is it becomes two lakhs, right? And how much is it in six years? How much is it in six years? Four lakhs. And then in nine years? Eight lakhs. So, so let's say someone is uh, 20 years old and they have one lakh, and they are increasing at 26% a year, how much will they have when they are 50 years old? So one lakh, then 23 per two lakhs, 26 per four lakhs, 29 per eight lakhs, you keep going. So it's 30 years from 20 to 50, right? Every three years you're doubling. So it's uh, two to the power of 10. That's 1024, right? Ye 1024 ko approximate kar lete hai to 1000. So it will become 10 crores, right? 1000 times 1 lakh is 10 crores, right? Now, let's say we go till the age of 80, another 30 years. So what will become to the 10 crores? It will become 10,000 crores, right? We started with one lakh at 20, and we never saved any money after that. We only had the one lakh, and it became, so Warren Buffett figured this out at uh, the age of 10, and then he did a lot of part-time jobs when he was growing up, 
like as a teenager, when he was 20 years old, he had uh, $10,000, which is about like 7 lakhs now. So he had 10,000 when he was 20 years old. And then when, when uh, this was in uh, 1950, and when I heard of him for, for the first time in 1994, uh, he had compounded this at 30% a year, okay, from 1950 to 1994. So it's 45 years, right, from 50 to 94. And 30% a year, there's something known as rule of 72. How many of you know rule of 72? Have you ever heard of rule of 72? Up baad mein third year IIT mein Google kar lena. So anyway, rule of 72 at 30%, the money doubles every 2.5 years. You know, at 26%, we were doubling every three years. So in 45 years, how many doubles are there? There are four doubles in 10 years, 16 doubles in 40 years, and another two doubles in five years. So two to the power 18. So two to the power 18, this is equal to two to the power 10 times two to the power eight. This is equal to 1,000 times 250, right? Approximately, 1,024 times 256. Don't do approximations on the JE paper, only do it over here. So this is 250,000 times 10,000. So that's 250000000. 000. So it's 2.5 billion. In rupees, this is 17,500 crores. Okay? From the 10,000. But then that was in 94. That time he was, uh, uh, he was uh, how old? He was uh, 64 years old. So then another 25 years have gone by on that compounding engine, on that 17,500 crores. So when you run that engine for another 25 years, he becomes the richest person in the world, like the chessboard guy. So to give you an answer on Dakshina 2.0, I had to explain this to you because I, when I heard of Buffett in 94, I said, I have so many in college and in school that no one has taught the most important thing is. All the things have taught me. You know, like what's the point of calculus? You know, I still haven't used calculus, but that's okay. So anyway, the thing is that I understood power of compounding. I understood how to compound at high rates. So Dakshina 1.0 has a problem. The problem it has is that there are finite number of IIT seats. There are finite number of medical seats. Uh, for example, I think that um, all IITs put together are taking like less than 15,000 students a year, maybe 13, 14,000 students a year. And we will at Dakshina not be able to, even at full maxed out, point in the future, we'll probably not be able to get to taking more than 20% of the seats. So maybe 2,000 seats we can take, you know, because it's so competitive, right? So if we take 2,000 seats in, uh, in IITs, let's say, I'll go to medical later, that's one of the reasons we started medical, and let's say our two-third conversion rate here. So which means we take 3,000 students who take the test every year, it costs us about two lakhs per student. So 
इसकी कॉस्ट इज 60 करोड़ ओके सो इफ वी आर लेट्स से वी टेक 3000 थाउजेंड स्टूडेंट्स अ ईयर विच माइट बी एट आर पीक कैपेसिटी वी वुड बी स्पेंडिंग अबाउट 60 करोड़ अ ईयर एंड इट के नॉट गो बियॉन्ड दैट बिकॉज यू रन आउट ऑफ सीट्स इवन टू गेट टू दिस पॉइंट विल टेक लॉट ऑफ एफर्ट राइट बट आई हैव अ कंपाउंडिंग इंजन दैट इज कंटिन्यूइंग ऑन सो दक्षिणा वन पॉइंट ओ रनज आउट ऑफ कपैसिटी वॉट अ ग्रेट प्रॉब्लम इट के नॉट टेक मोर इनपुट बिकॉज वी रन आउट ऑफ सीट्स ऑन द आउटपुट एंड सो दैट्स वाई वी हैव टू थिंक ऑफ टू पॉइंट ओ because 2.0 might open up we are trying to work on math math issues in schools in uh, government schools maybe because i like math you know so that's why there is dakshana 2.0 because 1.0 maxes out and the the compounding engine doesn't max out so it's great next question i'm shivangi from jnv bilwara rajasthan and my question is as our english teacher used to tell us a story of just four lines there was a boy he read a book the book changed him and he changed the world we are curious to know the book we which you used to read which can bring some positive change in you okay very good well one book i read in 94 was the one that explained all these fundas to me and the good news was i read the book and you showed up here isn't that great <laughs> thank god i read that book अगर कोई और बुक उठाई होती तो क्या होता राइट सो दैट वुड हैव बीन नॉट अ गुड आउटकम इफ आई हैड पिक्ड अप सम अदर बुक बट आई वुड से दैट या आई थिंक आई थिंक द बेस्ट टीचर्स आर बुक्स आई थिंक दैट देर इज अ लॉर्ड ऑफ कंडेंस नॉलेज इन बुक्स आई आई लव रीडिंग एंड आई थिंक दैट देर आर मेनी डिफरेंट बुक्स दैट सो आई थिंक दैट one of the things you want to do is you want to of course now you don't have any time when you go to iit or med school also you don't have much time after you finish you have to make sure you keep being a continuous learning machine and being continuing to grow and and develop and you can go anywhere right amazon is there flipkart is there you can buy books on all subjects and you read one book you like it you can go deeper in that area don't like it pick up something else and go from there so i think definitely um i mean if you read a book on lee kuan yew that's probably going to help you you read a book on pinochet that's also going to help you even though you may not like him and uh, but i think that you have to exercise your curiosities and for each of you the books and the journey you want to take will be different and that's fine uh next question i ning nei ching ho kip of znv tinom churchan pur manipur i'm honored to have this question there is um according to me no one is born rich this what i believe uh not of the materialistic richness but of the kindness and humanity that one acquires during his lifetime uh thousands of people become this so called successful by getting jobs and earning an indefinite amount of money but according to me success true success doesn't depend on how much you earn but on how much you can share that success to how many people and so according to this definition of success i take the privilege to claim that you are by far the greatest successful person that i have ever encountered till today and being the inspiration for each and every soul present in this campus i want to ask you a question that is what inspires you the most to become such a devotional man willing to give his all for the welfare of his people and what is the greatest profit that you get from this foundation is it a materialistic joy or, uh, is it a materialistic profit or the inner peace and joy of helping others okay well thank you very much and uh, i i am flattered please have a seat i am flattered with your uh, your comments but i know you will meet many many people in your life who will be much more successful than me so uh you'll do okay well i think that uh i uh, i did not uh, you know i think that i i already explained that i was trying to solve a problem of giving money away and i also wanted to solve the problem of giving it away effectively and i also like to play mathematical games as you see and so 
it wasn't it wasn't really anything I was trying to do in terms of let's do something great. I think I just wanted to kind of let's do something optimally, you know, as opposed to great. I think if it's done well, there are a lot of other people at Dakshina who've made that happen and who've done that. So that's uh, that's wonderful. And um, so my 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 take is just keep putting one foot in front of the other, uh, keep trying to improve things all the time. Uh, at Dakshna, all the, the full team tries to do that, Colonel and Sharmila and Commander, everyone is trying to do that. And uh, so I think that's the, the key. I don't pay too much attention to that uh, we are trying to do something great or something. I just say that let's try to make tomorrow better than yesterday and try to do it better tomorrow than yesterday. And then rest is we just let it go and let the chips fall there where they may. So next question. Good morning, sir. I am Prajal Pandey from Janvi Satna Madhya Pradesh. I want to ask you, sir, in future, till June 11, 24, 2044, do you have any plans to live in India and enjoy the pleasure of tradition and charm of Indian villages? Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, at this point, the plan is to enjoy the villages without living in India. So uh, many years I go to visit uh, Dakshna scholar homes in different parts of India. Like uh, this year, I had gone to uh, Ladakh and lay and that was before the Indian government put restrictions on the internet and movement of people so I got that done just in time uh, so that was good um, I think 2020 Colonel and I are planning to do a trip to Himachal you know in June July that'll be fun and I just I just finished a trip to Kerala so uh, yeah so I uh, one of the pleasures of Dakshina has been that I got to see a lot of rural India. I didn't get to see it by living in rural India, uh, just visiting. Uh, but you know, like I, I, I enjoy my life and my friends and uh, everything in California as well. So we mix it up. We visit here and we live there, and that's fine. So next question. My name is Sangadeep Brahmane from JNV Bundi, Rajasthan. And my question is, when will the India-Pakistan debate get finished? Okay. So in Bundi, were you in the Dakshina program? Yes, sir. You were there for two years? Yes, sir. And, and uh, then you just missed getting in? Yes, sir. So one more attempt. Yes, okay. Sir. Did you enjoy your time with Dakshina and Bundi? Lots. Okay. All right. So please have a seat. So. I don't know why you guys ask me all these controversial questions. <laughs> but we'll try to give you an answer as best I can. So before, uh, before I answer your question, I want you guys to listen to a video. It's about six minutes. I think we have time, right? This, we'll make this the last question. And then after the video, I'll try to answer your question. And so can we take the lights down and play the video? And uh, before they start the video, the video is a speech given by Martin Luther King. Uh, the speech is called, I Have a Dream. And, uh, and uh, it's probably, the, in my opinion, the best speech ever given by any human in history. Uh, maybe some of the Lincoln speeches might be better, but, um, but it's, a, it's a remarkable speech. So I want you to listen to the speech. Even if you don't care about the India-Pakistan question, you'll still get a lot out of the speech. And it covers the issue of reservations, caste, affirmative action, you know, we talked about. He'll cover that issue at all. So let's take the lights down. At this time, I have the honor to present to you 
the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, The, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. <laughs> we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time 
to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summit of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until that is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. <laughs> there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the vi victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream.
I am not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. And some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low the rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together this is our hope this is a faith that I go back to the south with with this faith we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope with this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, 
let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the crevaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. So, um, did you guys understand? We had text below. So anyway, it doesn't directly relate to the India-Pakistan issue, but it has, some, uh, it has some similarity in the sense that, so, uh, yeah, so his speech probably more directly relates to the caste issue in India, you know, because it's similar kind of history is going on. But the thing is that uh, the United States and Canada are neighbors, and it is the largest, uh, longest, unguarded border in the world. From US, many parts of the border, you can just walk to Canada. There's no fence. There are no troops, there are no fence, there's nothing. And, you know, uh, astronauts would say that when they look at Earth from space, they cannot see the boundaries of the countries. Right? You just see land mass, right? We are, we are one planet. And even, even when partition took place, so 1947, we had the big, biggest migration of humans in history, 10 million people moving across. And we had a lot of bloodshed, right? Lots of, lots of uh, violence and bloodshed. It was uh, one of the worst human tragedies. When Hindus were looking to kill Muslims in 47, they could not tell when they saw the person whether he's Muslim or not. They would tell the person to take down the pants. And they wanted to see whether the person is circumcised or not. And then they will know whether he's Muslim or not. Right? So you cannot even tell by looking at a person, is he Hindu or Muslim? You can't tell. You put a Hindu person uh, without Hindu clothes and Muslim person without Muslim clothes, you cannot tell the difference. Uh, most, of, most of my family was in Pakistan, what is now Pakistan, when partition took place. And they came across at very short notice as refugees into India. And um, in my ancestors, as far as, I, as far as I know, no one married any Muslim, as far as I know, looking back, as far back. I recently went through uh, genetic DNA test. You know, now you can just give saliva and get a DNA test done for $20. And there's a company called 23andMe. It does this testing. And it tells you who else may be related to you. They tell you that so-and-so may be a third cousin, so-and-so, people you don't know, because millions of people are doing this test. That test showed me Many people who are biologically related to me, who are Muslim, and who are living in Pakistan. So how did that happen? So the genetic test is not lying, right? It's a genetic test, right? 
the reason it happened is that with humans, what happens is that when a woman has a baby, it is not always true that the husband is the father. Right? Kabi kabi or cheese bhi ho jati hai. Right? So some relatives of mine way back in history, I don't know whether they're men or women or not, but they were having some things going on on the side. Right? And babies were born and different things happened. And now the test shows these results. So I just want to let you know what's kind of going on there. Uh, so, so the thing is that uh, a lot of these differences with the creation of Pakistan and Hindus versus Muslims, etc., these are man-made creations, man-made differences. In fact, between, between blacks and whites in the US, you don't need to take the person's pants down to know whether he's black or white. You can see it. But with Hindus and Muslims, you cannot do that. And in fact, if I look at someone like myself, I am genetically closer to people in Pakistan than I am to people from Kerala, right? And, and uh, in fact, uh, for many years, my, my family was living in Dubai. My father grew up in Lahore, and he was forced to leave when he was 17. First 17 years of his life, he was in Lahore. When he, when he moved to Dubai, Dubai is a place which has a lot of Indians and a lot of Pakistanis, and no violence. Indians and Pakistanis are living together. Our driver in Dubai was a Pakistani guy. I was all the time meeting all kinds of Pakistanis all over the place. My father was so happy when he was in Dubai because he, could, he was finally able to meet a bunch of people from Lahore and he could talk to them about his childhood, which he had never been able to do in India because he would hardly meet people who had been there. Yeah, man. ये यूसुफ लंगोटिया यार सी मेरा लाहौर में हमारे घर के सामने एक बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाबा आजम के जमाने <laughs> रोज शाम को हमने वहां पतंगे उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यूसुफ के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते यार प्लीज नमस्ते मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली और बेटे क्या हाल चाल है दादा जान दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों झजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन की तंग गली फिर से कूदे फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी काट ले के बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टीशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफ जी बड़ी याद आंदी कागजों की कश्तियों में डूब रहता था झाकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता था
हाँ जी कौन हैप्पी बर्थडे यार so the thing is that the two countries have a lot of mistrust with each other but it is actually one people and two countries it's not two people and two countries it's one people it's one universal group of people and i have a dream you know like mlk had a dream i too have a dream and i have a dream that that border between india and pakistan which today with i don't know 1000 kilometers plus long border has two or three maybe one main point is wagha border where you can actually go but basically there is no movement of people between the two countries it's completely frozen right you can hardly for pakistanis to get visa to india is very hard indians to get visa to pakistan is very hard moving from india to pakistan you probably have to take a flight to dubai and then go there you can't even go directly the number of people on either side of pakistan or india who wish the other country ill is a small number of people uh so what would what would actually help the situation in india and pakistan a lot in my opinion is if both countries had a lot of trade going on so if you open up a lot of trade and business links that's the starting point so both countries would benefit just like we would benefit if brazilian sugar came in whatever pakistan is great at producing and we brought that in those prices would be lower than they are in india and whatever india is great at producing we could send over we will do better both countries will be better off so i would say the first step towards uh, normalization is to focus on increasing trade and focus on increasing tourism and focus on movement of people on both sides now one of the things i find peculiar about the way governments sometimes the indian government works is in the united states we have the concept of innocent until proven guilty in india many times i feel the concept is guilty until proven innocent okay so i'll give you an example of the way indian laws work so when the mumbai terrorist attacks took place and those pakistanis came and we had all that bloodshed and all of that the indian government analyzed that whole situation and one of the things they found is that this guy headley who took all the pictures before the attack he came to india two th- two times before the attack took a lot of pictures of the different places they wanted to attack and then went back and he made two trips to india in a 60 day window so he came to india once took a bunch of pictures went back again came took a bunch of pictures went back so they looked at the data and they said that's the problem so what they said is no one should be allowed to come to india more than once in 60 days okay so they passed a law after the the mumbai attack that any person who is not a indian national who is visiting india once you visit you cannot visit again until two months have gone by okay that that law change actually affected me because i was i was coming frequently i couldn't i couldn't come i had to wait till that time period expired so what percentage of people traveling to india who are not indian citizens who are traveling within 2 months are terrorists what percentage is it 50% 10% 1% 0.1% no not even 0.1% it will go to 0.0001% somewhere because there are millions of people coming all the time okay so the thing is that we already have laws in the books 
that if someone does an illegal activity, like that Headley guy, so let's take the case of Headley. When he came to India twice, there was no law against that. Then he did this attack, and India had proof he was part of this attack. So they, if he ever get extradited back to India, he's in an American jail right now, but if he gets extradited back to India without that law, they can put him in prison. They can charge him because he committed a crime. So you did not need to change the law to take care of that guy. After a year or more, all these people are you know, clamoring on the government that this is stupid. They remove that law. Okay? So this is the way. So what happens is that a terrorist attack happens. Let's say Pathan Court or whatever happens. They, the the Samjhota Express gets shut down, right? The train going between India and Pakistan gets shut down. If some visit is planned, everything gets shut down. Bill Clinton said after the 9/11 attacks, you know, the terrorist attacks in the U.S., he said that they can never kill enough of us to make any difference. Okay. So whenever we take a, a, an action against terrorists, which takes away our freedoms, the terrorist wins, right? That's what they want. What you really want is to take actions which the terrorists don't want. What do the terrorists not want? They don't want free mingling of both these people. Let's do that. Okay, so there are already plenty of laws on both countries. If a bomb or a fire or there are plenty of laws in India. You can find the person and charge them. So don't be afraid of the one in 10,000 who will come across who the terrorists. Let's focus on the 9,999 who are coming across as normal citizens. Right? So they are just coming across to enjoy India, whatever else is going on. So I am, I am hopeful at some point that the two countries will understand that there's no point in having conflict. If you have conflict, you spend a lot of money on the military. Pakistan spends one third of his GDP on the military. It's a crushing load for them. Uh, India is richer, so we don't need to spend as much. But the, but the thing is that the first step is increased trade increase tourism, increase interaction of the people. Okay, when Indians interact a lot with Pakistanis, and Pakistanis interact a lot with Indians, what they'll realize is, ye to normal admi hai. Wo jo hum sab bol rahe hai, wo to strange hai. In Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Riyadh and all Indians and Pakistanis interact all the time. They don't go and have fights with each other, right? So, so for me, the, the relationship is one that we want to do everything we can to broaden the interface. We want to minimize the, uh, all these security checks and all that. We want to increase a lot of flights between both countries. Uh, and we want to increase all the interactions and uh, make it free. Make it, make it free for people to come and go. And, uh, and we, can, we can benefit. Uh, from all of that. So I think that is my, uh, my take on the India-Pakistan situation. Uh, but there are vote banks, and there are votes, and there are many issues surrounding that. But in spite of all that, you know, our prime minister invited the Pakistani prime minister to his first inauguration, right? He went to Pakistan on the prime, Pakistani prime minister's daughter's wedding. He showed up in Pakistan, right? So they took, they've taken steps. Uh, Vajpayee did a number of steps uh, to, to try to normalize. So I think at some point we are going to get uh, leaders on both sides who will be willing to take a lot of risks. So, you know, in uh, Egypt, Egypt and Israel were constantly fighting with each other. You know, Jews and Muslims, right? A lot of fighting. Anwar Sadat said, I'm going to make peace with Israel. Okay, and he took a helicopter from, from uh, Cairo to Jerusalem, right? 
people in Egypt were pissed off. They were very upset that how can this guy go to the land of the Jews, right? And so he made the peace, and then a few months after that, he's assassinated, right? Martin Luther King gave that speech. Within three years, he's assassinated. So there will be heavy prices to be paid for, with, by the people who do these things. But it is the right thing to do. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you guys again at the award ceremony. And also, yeah, yeah go ahead. I am Suresh Kumar from JNV Badmir, Rajasthan. So my question is, what were your thoughts when you were at the same age of us? And what was the turning point in your life that changed everything? Uh, my thoughts, please have a seat. My thoughts when I was the age of you are the same as your thoughts. OK? <laughs> There's no difference in the thoughts. And uh, I think the turning point is that I think that um, there will be points in your life when different forks in the road appear. You can go left or you can go, you can go right or you can go left. You can, the forks will keep coming. I think you have to be bold in the choices you make when those folks show up. And, uh, and they'll show up in all of your lives. So take the road less traveled and take the road with more risk and the returns will be better. So uh, do not be afraid of failing, you know? I would say that if you look at someone like Martin Luther King, he definitely took the road, road less traveled. Um, anyone who will try to normalize India-Pakistan relations um, has a target on his back, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but you have to take those, those stances if you want to move the conversation, right? And you have to do that. So, uh, but anyway, wish you all the best, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right.